Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the pleasure to be discussing with you the totally cool concept of cell messaging. That's right, cells are capable of communicating with one another. Now, you figure like, what, what would the cells be talking about, or what's the importance of this? Well, that's what the video is all about, but you gotta, you gotta think about it for a second. Think how important communication is between organisms, between individuals, and so cells ultimately need to uh, benefit from that type of exchange of information as well. And when you talk about like multicellular organisms, it's totally cool because certain cells of the body in one location can communicate with other cells of the body in a far away location. And then when you think about it, like some organisms are unicellular. And so when they communicate with other cells, it's sort of like the entire population is communicating. So this is really cool. And uh, it involves uh, a, a very important concept called signaling and signal transduction, which is how these chemical messages, which are which most of the signaling is, and how that those messengers get picked up by cells and how it's amplified. So this is the, the first in a series of a couple of videos it's going to be discussing signaling and transduction, signal transduction. So right out of the gate, I just want to say it's it's essential cell-to-cell uh, -cell communication. It's really important that cells will be able to communicate a, a variety of things. And hopefully in the video that will become clear when I go through a few examples of why cells would want to be talking in the first place. And so what's, what's also particularly interesting is that biologists have discovered some universal mechanisms that are in common between yeast, between bacteria, and even humans. It's highly suggestive of the fact that these signaling transduction pathways have evolved very early on in the evolution of life and have stayed with us and have been conserved. And so another strong piece of evidence for uh, evolution from a common ancestor, just to throw that out. <laughs> and so, you know, when you look here, can you imagine living in the savanna, it, it, especially if you're an impala? I mean, talk about somewhat stressful. I mean, one minute you're there grazing and then all of a sudden a cheetah comes flying out of nowhere and it's chasing you down. What do you think the impala is thinking right now? It's running for its life. It's running as fast as it can. Its heart rate is beating and it's like, oh my God. And so you might think, well, d the fact that it's being chased or it saw a cheetah might release a little bit of, um, you know, epinephrine. <laughs> and so if you think about it, that molecule itself, epinephrine, initiates what, what is a classic phenomenon in biology, which is called fight or flight. Either you're going to be up for battle or you're going to try to run away. But nevertheless, this chemical is secreted by the particular, the, the Apollo's uh, adrenal glands. And what this is doing is it circulates in the blood and it's causing the, the heart to beat a little faster. It's causing the, the animal to breathe a little bit faster. And so therefore, it's able to get more energy and be able to run away if, if, if that's what it needs to do. And so most of the messaging that we're going to be discussing is that, for example, a cell, and let me, let me go back to that for a second, a cell is going to be uh, producing chemicals and they're going to be secreting them. And this is an example of what epinephrine looks like. And so this, for example, would be traveling, this is a hormone, travels into the blood and it'll be picked up by other cells in the body. And in this case, it'll affect heart rate and breathing. And so these are the cells that are producing it. Uh, and these are the cells that are like, secreting it. These are the, the target cells that are receiving the message. Now, sort of like a text message, that these messages, these chemicals are intended to a, a particular recipient. They're not necessarily universal for everyone to pick up. And so that's kind of interesting. So, you know, what what's the what's the cell talking? What it, what are they saying? And what is the cell that's listening? How does it, how does it listen? How does it respond to that? And so let's begin this whole discussion by looking sort of at, at where it may have begun in the first place, which is the study of communication between microorganisms. That's right, you know, the, sometimes often forgotten, these microscopic organisms are the most numerous on the planet, and they're very, very essential. And so one of the more important organisms, especially as it relates to human, is this 
yeast. And so you, as you can see here is a scanning electron micrograph um, showing the sort of round nature of yeast. And as it turns out, these little appendages that are coming off are new yeast cells that are budding off. Um, and so they're, they're as a result of mating, uh, these new cells are growing and dividing. And so one of the conversations that yeast have with one another, the cells do, is about sex. And so as it turns out, there's two mating types, kind of like male and female, not necessarily. So there's this little a and, and uh, little alpha. And so how do they find each other? How do, the, how do the two mating types find each other? Well, they secrete chemicals. And so if this one's secreting it and this one's secreting chemicals, they'll be able to uh, locate each other. And so as you can see here in this diagram, here's the little a, here's the, here's the little alpha. This is secreting an alpha factor and a little a factor, and it's picked up by membrane-bound protein receptors. And so these uniquely fit these protein receptors, which then initiates some kind of response. So the first thing is the reception of, of the signal and then some kind of response. And in this case, uh, mating is going to occur between the two cells, and then there's a, a, a hybrid form of, uh, of, of yeast, which is... Um, genetically uh, different than both of them individually. So another really cool example, one of my favorites uh, in biology is how bacteria communicate. And so bacteria, of course, are prokaryotes. And so they, they're individual uh, unique organisms. And one of the coolest things that I can think of in biology is this symbiotic relationship that bacteria have with this squid. Uh, this is a Hawaiian squid called the bobtail squid. And what's very fascinating about it is that the, the bacteria are bioluminescent. Right? And so they're capable of producing this chemical that will literally glow. And what they do is they live with the bobtail squid, squid and so they cause the squid itself to glow. And so What's fascinating, as we study more and more about the pathways of which the bacteria can do this, as I mentioned before, they're very similar, these signal transduction pathways to eukaryotes. And so they provide a, a lot of um, interesting sources of information that we can learn from them. And so what happens is that the bacteria produce these chemicals and that other bacteria can pick them up and they're able to detect the fact when their numbers increase. And so what I mean by that is uh, there's this bobtail squid and the bacteria live inside of it in a particular light organ that it has. And so they're, they're, it's a symbiotic relationship. As it turns out, by living in the bobtail squid, they get lots of nourishment from the bobtail squid, but they provide this other benefit, mutualistic relationship. They're able to glow, and they're bioluminescent. And so they do that, and that's particularly good for the bobtail squid. Uh, it's, they, they bioluminesce, sort of like a firefly would make light, if you're familiar with that. And so what's fascinating is that the bacteria are you know, normally invisible, but, and so you can't really see them or really easily understand what they're doing biochemically. But if they're producing a bioluminescence, you can kind of see their presence and see sort of what they're doing. And so you can sort of understand this partnership and so the partnership begins when you know from the squid point of view is that you know it's if if you're a squid you're kind of like scared of predators you know I, at least i would be and so during the day they find themselves you know burying themselves in the sand so they don't get in trouble so they're mostly nocturnal they come out and so at nighttime they still would need to be sort of camouflaged from predator or at least be camouflaged to, to go after a prey themselves. And so um, at nighttime, what happens is the bacteria that are present inside the bobtail squid, when the numbers get really high in terms of the bacteria pop population, they start to secrete chemicals, communication chemicals that will allow this bioluminescence to take place. And what happens is when they glow, it provides this sort of counter shading. And so it, from the moonlight, it's very difficult to see if you're a predator or a prey of the bobtail squid. And so it's very useful to the squid to have these bioluminescent bacteria hanging out with them. What's fascinating is that the, the numbers have to grow large. The particular bacteria that, that bioluminesces is this Vibrio fisher, fisheri. And so the Vibrios 
they, when they get really high, they start producing these chemicals and then they, that reaches a, a particular threshold and then they're able to start to bioluminesce. And this happens usually in the evening. And then during the day, the numbers are, are, are low and they don't need to bioluminesce. So uh, what's the trick they use is that they produce these chemicals called autoinducers, the bacteria cells. And so they produce it. And so these things are floating around. And the thing is, if you produce this in the open ocean, you know, generally these autoinducers will just sort of float away. But if you're inside the squid and you make these and the bacteria numbers get more and more and more and more, eventually the concentration of these autoinducers rise and then they actually get picked up by protein receptors in the bacteria membrane. And so if you can think of them, these autoinducers sort of like as hormones. They're the chemical messages that cells send. And so they make and they release these molecules. And when they're alone, they're the, and the, the cells are in low number, the, the molecules just float away, as I was mentioning. But in the bacteria, don't perceive them, and they don't make light. It's only when the bacteria numbers are large and they make a lot of autoinducer, that's when they get the message and they start to... Uh, produce bioluminescence and so their concentration is proportional of the inducer molecule to the number of organisms and so when the molecules hit a certain amount that's when all the light is turned on and so it's particularly useful because it's it's turned on in the evening for these bobtail squids so they can have counter shading and so what we believe is that the molecules are sort of a proxy for uh, cell number I don't know I, I'm pretty sure the cells don't know how many bacteria there are, but when the numbers rise, that's when they're able to accomplish something. And so this phenomena is known as quorum sensing. And so the bacteria sort of have a quorum. They take a vote with these molecules and they're like, okay, they don't have any words, but the chemicals are the words. And so they're able to talk to each other with the autoinducers. And so they put out their vote and if, they're, it's, if they get enough individuals and, 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 and they're unified, then they have a quorum and they're ready to do something. And so that's critical because individual organisms alone aren't very successful. For the strength of the bacteria is the, is the group, <laughs> if you will. And so the bacteria are able to coordinate their response, and in this case, bioluminesce. But in other instances, pathogenic bacteria, want, that you, do, you wouldn't want to attack uh, an organism if your numbers are low. And so they, they use autoinducers to get a quorum, they sense each other's presence and then respond. A different example also of, of bacteria though, there's some so soil dwelling bacteria that uh, can use chemical signals like autoinducers uh, to sort of share information amongst each other about nutrient availability. So when food is scarce in the, in the soil, sort of the so starving cells start to secrete molecules and that is picked up by their neighboring cells and they begin to aggregate and collect and so they start forming this structure here's a picture of the aggregation in progress in this particular gathering of cells is called a fruiting body and as it turns out it produces a thick walled spore and it's capable of surviving when the environmental conditions are not very good and so it, it's able to allow the bacteria to sustain until water is available or more nutrients are available. And so these fruiting bodies are able are helping the bacteria survive when the environmental conditions um, uh, get a little bit better. So cells communicate uh, locally and long distance. I mentioned a little bit before about the impala producing the hormone epinephrine. That's an example of long distance. But let me start off with local first. So these chemical messengers, now how do, they, how do they get across from cell to cell? I mentioned these receptors, but they can also travel between cells because cells have gaps between them, animals and plant cells, at least some cell tissues do. And then sometimes they're picked up just by direct contact, cell to cell. Let me give you an example of that. So in animal cells, sometimes there's passageway between cells. There's literally gaps between the uh, plasma membrane of cells, and those are called gap junctions. So literally these molecules can pass and communication can uh, occur between adjacent cells. Also plant cells, even between the cell wall and the cell membrane, there are these channels called plasma desmata, which will allow adjacent cells to 
communicate. Now that's totally local. And then when cells actually physically, when one protein interacts with another protein in the membrane, as you can see right here, that's local cell to cell recognition. And so that will, you know, well, what are they doing? Well, that's going to initiate some kind of response. So this cell is telling this cell to do something. Maybe this cell is part of the immune system and it's, it's telling this cell to do something. Okay, maybe these are white blood cells, for example. Now, in many instances, animal cells communicate using these local regulators, so these chemical mole molecules that travel a short distance. Another great example, one of my favorite examples of this, is that when we have a cut and there's a damage to a blood vessel, for example, the little tiny um, structures inside the blood called platelets. These platelets are really good causing the blood to coagulate or to clot, but they also produce chemicals, cell messenger molecules, what we're talking about. The platelets produce these chemicals called platelet-derived growth factor. And what, what the target is, is the connective tissue that's inside of a blood vessel. And when the cells, these cells of the connective tissue, let me draw them in, are called fibroblast cells. And this is what the fibroblast cell looks like under the scanning electron microscope, like little stars. Now, these guys are really important in connective tissue. They produce lots of collagen, which is found in the extracellular matrix. But you need these cells to start to divide in order for the blood vessel to be healed. These fibroblast cells are also in the skin. So if you have a cut, it's the platelets that are producing a chemical that says, hey, uh, fibroblast cells start dividing. And so we're able to study this in the lab. Like, so in other words, you can take up some connective tissue and chop it up like this. And these, are the, these, these would be the fibroblast cells. And so you can isolate the cells by adding some chemicals that will dissolve away that the collagen from them, and then you can try to grow them. But they won't grow very well, even if you give them growth medium, or if you give them 37 degrees and trying to make them happy. But if you add some platelet-derived growth factor, which are these chemicals that are produced by the platelets, those chemicals will tell the fibroblast cells to divide. And so that's how we're able to culture a lot of fibroblast cells in the lab. We, we have to add, see here we are growing them, like you have to add PDGF in order to get the fibroblasts to divide. So that's an example of a molecule that is being released, a chemical messenger from the platelet, and the target cell is the fibroblast cell, as you can see here, in the blood vessel in order to heal, because the fibroblast cells are, are trying to heal. Now, an example of the long distance would be hormones. We, I mentioned epinephrine. Now, hormones, what's cool about that is, you know, a well, long distance, how does it travel? It uses the bloodstream. So hormones are generally produced by cells, like for example, in a human, produced in a gland, and those are secreted into the blood. So it's called endocrine. And those hormones travel, and they travel throughout the body, and then they're picked up by a particular target cell. So here's the secreting cell. So it's producing some sort of chemical it's traveling through the blood, and it's going to all different cells, so this cell would ignore it, but then this cell would pick it up, and then this cell would have some kind of response to that signal. So that's how a hormone works. It's a chemical messenger. And so when cells secrete locally, so let's go back a second. So local secretion. So this is an example of a cell that's secreting just to adjacent cells in a particular area. For example, this could be a, the platelet-derived growth factor, which is uh, these little red dots, and the target cell would be fibroblast. That's an example of paracrine secretion, meaning para is a, a, a prefix that means adjacent to. And then one of the most important chemical messengers in the entire human body is when neurons, this is an axon of one neuron, is communicating with another neuron it, they don't actually touch each other, but they secrete chemicals called neurotransmitter. And so that, this is synaptic signaling, traveling across the synapse. Synapse is just a generic term meaning where two things come together. So across this junction, the neurotransmitter is released, communicating, cell-to-cell -cell communication. And then again, endocrine, where a hormone is secreted into the blood, it travels really far and goes to a target cell. And so here's a close-up of that. 
So this is paracrine secretion. This is uh, synaptic secretion here, a neurotransmitter. Again, neurotransmitter, totally cool. Uh, there's a video, if you could search for this on, on the YouTube channel on, um, on action potential, it's really cool. So neurotransmitters are secreted by in the axon and they travel across the synapse and they're picked up by receptor proteins. And in this case, uh, acetylcholine will cause a sodium uh, chemical gated ion channel to then open. When the, when the chemical attaches to the protein, it causes a conformational change, which allows sodium to then enter into uh, another neuron, which will start a depolarization. So hormones, totally important. An example of what we're talking about, cell messaging. Hormones travel into the blood and they go and they cause the cell to do something that it wasn't doing before. So let's talk about that. So here's a cell. Here's the hormone traveling in the fluid, and this is what we call a signal transduction pathway. So in other words, the message doesn't have to go into the cell. It just causes a conformational change in the protein, which then, that's step one, called the reception of the message. And then sometimes in a cell, this transduction pathway involves a series or a cascade of secondary molecules that will alter physically and chemically the pathways inside the cell. And what I mean by that is that they'll either amplify or cause some sort of protein alteration. In other words, there could be some kinases, there could be some phosphates added here. Nevertheless, the message is transduced across the cytoplasm. Sometimes it even goes into the cell nucleus and causes RNA to be produced or, or causes small RNA to be produced and it stops something or it starts some genes or it causes enzymes to be produced and all of that is a response. It might even cause the cell to divide. So in other words, if this is protein derived growth factor, it would cause the fibroblast cell to start to divide and so that would, that would be an initiation of division. So it's broken up and there's more to come when it, about the signal transduction pathway. It's kind of mysterious the way I'm sort of discussing it, but I, I, I will produce another video getting into, into the detail if you're interested. But here it is, step one is reception. So you receive the message and then that message needs to be converted into some sort of response. And so how it's done is through transduction. So it's signal transduction pathway which then leads to some kind of cellular response. And so the cellular response could be, could be varied. And so let me close with this, this little video clip sort of discussing that. Cells communicate with one another by means of chemical signals. For the receiving cell, there are three stages in the signaling process, reception, transduction, and cell response. The cell targeted by a particular signal has a receptor molecule complementary to the signal molecule or ligand. The ligand... So let me, let me emphasize that. The ligand is the signal molecule. The ligand is the signal molecule. And the receptor protein is very specific so that these messages are targeted. Like a key in a lock and triggers a change in the receptor molecule. Signal transduction converts the change in the receptor to a form that can bring about a cellular response. This might involve a series of steps, a signal transduction pathway that alters and amplifies the change. In the third stage of cell signaling, the transduction process brings about a cellular response. This can be any of many different cellular activities, such as activation of a certain enzyme, rearrangement of the cytoskeleton, or activation of specific genes. So, in other words, the cell's doing something that it wasn't doing before or it stops doing something that it wasn't doing before, or it produces a protein that it wasn't doing before, or it initiates division when it, w it wouldn't of if it didn't receive that external message. And so I hope you enjoyed this particular video, which was an introduction to cellular messaging. Thanks for watching.